It's okay. Yeah, I was uh, I was up till two o'clock yesterday night uh, watching. So then it didn't. It seems it's not working out, which is okay. It happens. So all right. So this is our last lecture, and uh, we will be just having a closing of some sort. Uh, I just want to say, you know, it's really been nice, you know, knowing some of you. But uh, all of you feel free to, you know, if you want to approach me in any way, if you have any questions on the pr presentations, or, you know, if you want any other advice, then I'll try my best to provide that. So, so you have my email address, that's the best way to get hold of me, that's that Khanna S at Missouri.edu. So, and you have all these PowerPoints also, I think. Were you able to get all of those? Yeah. So, so please feel free to, you know, uh, contact me anytime you want, okay? Right. So, what I'm going to talk today is, uh, let's think. Is on uh, blast resistant that composite glass we have been talking about in the last couple of days. So I just want to. I think we lost. Uh, okay. So let's talk about, so you know, so laminated glass, I think I might have already told you about this, but uh, so we have this here as this is our, in 1910, so it's been more than 100 years that this was discovered and they used this PVB, which is uh, this, uh, we already talked about that that's used to laminate the composite. and. Uh, Sometimes they also use polycarbonate or they use uh, polyurethane. Right? So, if you can see here, uh, this, you know, we are going to, in, in this one, we use the transparent E glass fibers. Polyester was the, the laminate, uh, the matrix material, and we use tempered glass sheets. Now, polyester was selected as the matrix as it is very cheap. Uh, it's cheaper than vinyl ester or epoxy. And as comparable, tensile strength was slightly lower than tensile modulus. Okay. And if you look at this chart here, this pie chart, you will see that the polyester, 60% of the polymers used is polyester. 25% is epoxy and then 5% is vinyl ester and then all the others are a few percent. Okay. So it's the most readily These are some of the properties of the composite that, so these are the polyester material and this is the e-glass fiber. And uh, so the most important thing to note here is that the refractive index at 589 nanometers wavelength of light, which is close to the uh, sodium, that yellow light here, uh, this is 1.5595. And that is 1.5520. So there is a small difference in the uh, refractive indices. So 
So whenever a, a ray of light comes, like you do experiments in physics, you have a ray of light, it enters a glass sheet, so it diffracts and goes into a different direction, some of it reflects back. And uh, so now there are hundreds of fibers. By the time the light ray goes through the full thickness of the composite, so at every fiber it is diffracting and reflecting. So by the time the light comes out, if the refractive index match is not good to the third decimal, then you have too much loss of light by the time it comes out on the other end. And there's a lot of distortion in the image. Okay. So that's what we try to uh, chemically match this. And as I said earlier that the refractive index of glass fiber is very difficult to change. People have tried that. So what we did was we changed the refractive index of the polyester, the matrix itself. Now when you cure, when you try to cure the polyester, you use these chemicals. This is methyl ethyl ketone peroxide, that's the MEKP. And then we also add, with, so we use about 2% by weight of MEKP. We use uh, cobalt uh, oxonate here, and this is used to accelerate the reaction. If we only use MEKP, then unless we use large amounts of it, the MEKP uh, does cure the polyester, but it takes very long time. So to improve the, the reaction rate, then we add some cobalt to it. And this divinyl benzene or phenanthrene that you see here, these are two monomers, okay? These are two uh, polymers which are added to the polyester mixture to change the refractive index, okay? So these two were used to change the refractive index of the polyester. So if you look here, then if we add MEKP, uh, different amounts, we started with like half percent, one percent, one point five, two percent. There is a very small change in the refractive index, but not nothing significant. If we add cobalt, there is a small increase in the, so this number, if you look here, this is 0 0.02 percent by weight. 0 0.03, 0 0.04, and so on. So if we go from 0 0.02 to 0 0.03, we go through about, this is 1.55, about uh, 2, and we get to 1.555. So there is a very small increase in the, in the third decimal by about 0 0.001 or so. So that change is okay, but so we can keep going and add more and it will become uh, the refractive index of the, uh, the glass fiber. But the problem is if you add this cobalt, the, the polymer begins to get dark because cobalt that is very dark blue color. So we found that if we add more than 0 0.03, the polyester becomes really very almost like dark orange color. So then that's not thing which is good for like a window uh, application. So we did not, so we add very little of cobalt and it doesn't change much the refractive index. Now if we add divinyl benzene, then if you go from, this is 5%, 10%. So if we go from like about 3%, we get 1.555. And if we go to a little higher, about 6% or so, then we get 1.56. So 1.56 is more than the refractive index of the glass fiber. So somewhere between 3 and 5% is what we need to add. So we ended up with adding 4%. Now, the other problem with uh, this is that if you remember yesterday, we said that the 
the polyester matrix, it changes its refractive index when you stress it. By load, then unloaded, it has a refractive index. When you have load, it changes. So, fabricate a composite, you liquid polymer, you put glass, and then when the polymer starts to begin, become hard, what does it do? Clamps down on the fiber. Okay, so there's a fiber, it, it tries pressure. Creates a index also local. So then it's the contribution of the clamping pressure versus that the divinyl benzene. So so by trials we found that about four percent addition of divinyl seems to work the best. So all those pictures you saw were based on four percent. There's another monomer, polymer, which is uh, financery. Now here, this change happens very fast. Okay? So I went from 0.5 to 1 to 1.5 percent by weight, and look, this went from 1.556, it went to 1.561. So there's a big jump. Where I, I want is 1.559, which is here. Okay. And so, so that means here this one is about 1 percent, close to 1 percent. So we can use one or the other, both of them. So, so this is what uh, we have for, uh, so if we add 1.28 percent of MEJP, 4 percent of divinyl benzene, and 0 0.03 of this, we got 1.5587. And uh, the refractive, so if we add 1 percent phenanthrene, then we get 1.5599, okay, for the refractive index of the polyester. So they are both fairly close to the, the glass refractive index. If you look at the transmission of light through it, then this is the transmittance percentage. So if there is a light intensity coming in, and then whatever is coming out on the other end, it, the percentage of that, uh, the percentage of light coming out as uh, reference to the incoming light, then this is how it looks like. So basically then, uh, this curve here is for the composite, okay, these two. This is for the polyester only. So if you don't have any fibers in it, then this is the light transmission. So notice that below 400, there is nothing much going in because it's not visible anymore. So as soon as you hit a little bit over 400, it shoots up. So it's about here, about 450 nanometers. And then it's fairly constant for polyester. But for the composite, for higher and higher wavelengths of light, so as you move towards red light, the transmittance is coming down. So in the visible range, 400 to 700, which is this range, we have about 70 to 80, somewhere between 70 to 80 percent transmittance. So which is uh, fairly good, but we would have liked to be a little bit over 80 percent. The, the standards call for 80 percent. So we are close to or just below that, okay? So if you are right here for about this sodium light, okay, then we are at the highest point. Both sides, it drops. So that's uh, this red line, I'm not going to talk about that, but that's based on some theory that we try to develop to predict the light transmission, okay? So this is the theory which gives us that that red light. Uh, this is just the mechanical properties. So we have here, this is a fiber reinforced composite with 3.2 millimeter thickness and about 12 percent watt fiber volume fraction. 
the lower one, these values are for 1.6 millimeter thickness and about 25 percent volume fat. And so we get the tensile strength as 139 megapascal, failure strain 0 0.01, the elastic modulus is about 12 GTA and the Poisson's ratio is 0.39 and the shear modulus is about 3.3 3 .3 GTA. So this is the high strain rate response of the interlayer okay. So we again this into the Hopkinson bar, we made samples, put it in there. And so this lowest blue line is for 400 per second strain rate, this is 550. This one is uh, 800, the green, and 950 is the upper one, the upper mode. So that gives you the stress strain response. Uh, this is strain and this is the stress. Okay. And you get, what do you get? What sort of stress and strain is that? Now, this is the, uh, this is so small, let's see, let's try to see if I can enlarge it. Hopefully you can see it a little better now. So, so these are some of so you evaluate the window after it has been subjected to a blast flow. So the uh, defense people have come up with certain guidelines. So this the first column here is called the performance condition. So one, two, three, a, three, b, four, five, like that. The second one is the protection level that window is providing you. So number one is safe, very high, 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 medium, low, and so on. And then the hazard level is this. So, but what does that mean? So if you want to have performance condition number one, then it says the glazing does not break, no visible damage in the frame. Okay. So glazing is the glass sheet glaze like you do glazing on something like so, the glazing part. So they say that that's the outer glass sheet. So if you have glazing cracks but remain in the frame during and very small fragments come out on the floor. And then glazing cracks, fragments enter space and on the floor as further as uh, further than three feet from the window. Okay. So, so this is, and then you have here. Uh, this is the hazard level. That means, is there a danger to the people inside? Okay. That's the hazard part. So here, because glazing does not break, it does not damage. So there is no hazard level because it doesn't affect the person. Now here it says it's very high. That means the glazing crack. Window fails, fragments fly into the room, and uh, they, the window panel, at, and uh, they fly more than 10 feet away from the window. Okay. So that one is very high. So this uh, hazard level is very high. And the protection level is very low, the reverse of that. So that's how you rate the performance of the, the windows.
then there are these three dominant blast loads that are also standardized. So I think you already saw there's a 4 PSI, 10, and 30 PSI. Now it's also you know associated with you never just say 4 PSI, but you also talk of the the, the impulse associated with it. And you already saw that this is the uh, blast uh, tube that we had used. Now in this blast tube, but I did not show you this that time. So, so this one, so this P, P here, here, here. These are the five uh, points where they were measuring the displacement. Okay. So now, so this is the window, and this one is right at the corner in the frame. So that, so they put a, a transducer there to see if there is not, there should not be too much movement at the end of the window. Most of the movement should be in the wind, in the glass portion and not in the frame. And then, so the main, our main interest was in the center one. So, and this was done by using a LVDT, the linear variable transformer. So we found that, and as I showed you in the simulation yesterday, that we were trying to match our results numerically with this center point deflection. There was also a video camera which was put somewhere on the side to record. So this is what it looks like on the inside when it is all put in there and it's ready. Now this little tape portion you see here, uh, that was uh, put to have that uh, the tip of the LVDT come and sit there, okay? Uh, because this uh, this glass is so smooth, okay? And that little point when it comes, they put a little tape piece of tape so that it has better contact. Otherwise, it tries to slip around. And this is what you already have seen that you get the pressure time curve and the displacement time curve. So you get this for every every uh, sample you test. So what we did was, uh, so let me try to see if I can enlarge this also a little bit. So what you see here, uh, this is our, so we, we tested seven windows. The first one is, the thickness of this is three by eight inches. So the glass sheet is one, one by eight, the composite interlayer is one by eight, and then the next glass sheet is one by eight. So that total comes to about three, three by eight inches. Last load level is C, so C is, or PSI and some millisecond uh, the impulse with it. So under this condition, we found there was no damage at all. So performance condition is one. That's what we saw from there. Then again, the exact same window, three by eight inches, but now damage, uh, the blast load level is D. So D is 10 PSI. So again, we found there is no damage. It, it was just intact. Then we went to level E, the same window, three by eight. So we got a little excited, and we went to level E. So what happened here now, it is 30 PSI. So it, so it went up three times compared to the, you know, the, the, the level D and about eight times compared to level C. So this was then severely cracked and the window was thrown out of the frame. Okay. I'll show you some pictures of that. So the window was thrown out. So then we said, okay, so maybe one interlayer sandwich between two glass sheets is not enough. So we made another window where we have now glass composite, glass composite, glass. So we have two interlayers, two of them. So now the thickness becomes about five by eight, okay, five by eight inches, which is about 16 millimeters. 
then we did level E blast again and the cracks, there were some cracks in the front and rear but no damage to the interface. Okay. So now the performance condition is somewhere between 2 and 1. Okay. So it's a, uh, let's say 2 to be on the conservative side. There was minor cracking on the glass but otherwise nothing came out of it so it was intact. Then uh, we tried a 3 by 8 again here. Uh, the same thing happened, so that's it. Then we tried slightly, uh, this is 7 by 16, okay. So a slightly different thickness. So uh, 7 by 16 is slightly thinner than this. So we used a thinner interlayer and then we get that there were cracks in front and rear of the glass, minimal damage to the interlayer. So there was some damage to the interlayer and uh, the performance condition was 3A. So the cracks, so in when you have performance condition 2, there are cracks in it but if you move your hand on the glass, you will not feel any crack, you will not feel any crack. It will be very smooth and there are just some minor cracks. So that's how we kept uh, going and did some more tests. This is how the, the construction looks like. So we have an aluminum frame like this. So we, and then we put the window inside this frame. We put it inside half inch into that frame from here. And then we fill it up with some adhesive, silicone sealant adhesive on the side. Okay. And then we bolt these. So there you can see some bolts here and here on the side. There is a another supporting plate and what is this? This is just a, a tubular section, a rectangular tube. So we took two rectangular tubes, okay, one on the top, one on the bottom. In the middle we put the window on it but half inch support, put sealant, this black sealant and put the two frames on top. Then we bolt the two frames together. And that's what this plate is doing. Then we put, put a face plate on this side and just bolt the two. So, so we are going. So it's not a regular window frame like you see in here, but it kind of still uh, the principle is the same. Okay, these frames are a little more complicated looking in shape, but that's exactly by and large what they do. They also have a half inch overlap. So this is what happened to that. 3 by 8 inch window I told you and level E blast that 30 psi. You see what I, the, the whole window was just thrown out and you see there is a big crack you know that it was completely bent out of shape. So this is and this is how it looks here. It, it's all gone. The glass, there is no glass on it anymore. It's just sealed off. So that didn't work. Uh, this is how the construction looks like so you see here that the window was supposed to be in this groove here okay so it was just completely thrown out of here this one and this is that channel section the rectangular channel this is the vertical part this is the horizontal part here going up, so it's sandwiched in between there. So this is then the 7 by 16 inch slightly thinner window but two interlay. Okay. And uh, you can see there is some damage here, there is some, there, there, the composite interlayer is cracked here, there are lots of cracks in the interlayer. But, but what is uh, still the salient feature is there is no hole in it, nothing complete broke out, the wind was still in the spray. So, so normally if a hole is made, okay, the, the standard for survival or passing 
the standard test if a hole is made is you take a two inch steel ball two inch diameter steel ball and you put it on top of that hole if that ball falls through the hole then you fail the test the window the window fails the test, the test. if the two inch ball doesn't pass through that hole then the then it is then you pass the test if it falls through, you fail the test. So, so that's the criteria. So, so, so some small holes, if they are made, but if the two-inch ball, which is heavy, doesn't fall through, then you still pass the window. Uh, this is just a close-up view of the this five by eight-inch level E glass window. Uh, you can see that there are some cracks, but you can s there is still transparency in it, in there. You can still see through in the back all that that wooden frame in the back and so on. There is some loss of transparency, but by and large the interlayer was intact. There's, there are these all these fine cracks in the glass portion of the of that window. So this is again just taken out and put here. So this was so this is a five by eight inch two interlayer window subjected to a thirty psi blast. So thirty psi means that you see this is thirty six inches by twenty twenty four inches. Thirty psi for the so the peak pressure on this is or uh, the peak load on this is almost about twenty five thousand pounds even though it is applied for a short period, but it is an enormous amount of loading on there. And it is still uh, almost intact. And I also mentioned to you that we did the field test, which is the open door or the open in the open field. So this was uh, again, this is the uh, the explosive, it is a high grade TNT explosive, it was uh, 1 kg of the explosive and the distance from here to the glass window is 5 feet. So it is about, about this distance between here and that one. So it is fairly close. Okay. And these are uh, acoustic transducers here, uh, these are pressure transducers, so when the, the blast happens then this is right in the plane of the window to see what was the pressure just uh, recording here when when this blast happened. Okay. On the back side you see this rod, uh, that rod actually comes and touches this in the center. So we did not have a good way of finding the displacement in the open field test this setup we had. So what we did was we put that glass rod and it was a, uh, so on the back there is a thick wooden piece, there is a hole in it and that, that wooden rod passes through the hole. So when we just touch it there, we mark where the, how much it is coming out. And it is a not, you know, so it slides in the, in the hole, but it is a, you know, slight, it is slightly difficult to move it. It is not very, it is not like a loose sliding press. So, you have to pull on it to, so that, so when the blast happens, when the window deflects, it will move that rod back, but it will not throw it away. So, it, it has to apply a positive, uh, large positive pressure to move it. And uh, so, so we got approximately what is the deflection. So, it is a crude way of doing it, but that is what was done. Now, what I am going to do is, we have a little video, I think some of you came in and the, when I was trying to test this, let us see if it works, it is really hard to make it work, but we try. MU Mechanical Engineering Professor Sanjeev Khanna and his team detonated a small
represents a small bomb going off next to a building with windows. But this is not your typical window. This is explosion-resistant glass created by University of Missouri researchers. The results were fantastic. Uh, they were much beyond our expectations. MU mechanical engineering professor Sanjeev Khanna and his team detonated a small amount of explosives within five feet of the multi-layered transparent glass. If it's exploded, we want this window to be able to sustain that blast. Especially, we don't want any hole to be punctured in the glass panel. The glass draws its strength from a layer of glass fibers embedded in plastic. The glass fibers are very thin, only half the thickness of a human hair. The more fibers added, the more durable the glass. Because the glass is thinner, it will use less material and be cheaper than conventional blast-resistant glass. Has uh, a lot of other applications besides explosions. The super-strong glass could be used to protect residential windows from powerful hurricane winds or earthquakes. A team from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, who is funding the research, was on hand to observe the test. EMU researchers say the blast-resistant glass could have military uses as well. With these tests, EMU researchers are redefining the strength of glass. In Rala, Kent Faddis reporting. Thank you. We had this uh